Hello, and welcome to Field Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the fields of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. Today we'll be talking to guests Dr. Randy Kolka and Trent Wickman about the effects of fires on mercury concentrations and young of the year perch. How does mercury get into fish? How do you know if it did? What role do fires, wild and planned, play in the cycles of both? Answers to all these and more coming right up. I'm your host, Abby Morrison. Let's talk about science. Hi guys, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Excellent, how are you? I'm doing super. <laughs> it's all good here. Perfect. So we are going to be talking about perch and wildfires today, but first, why don't you guys tell me a little bit about both of you, your personal and professional background that brought you to your science? Sure. I got my bachelor's degree at UW-Stevens Point, University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point in soils, and a master's and PhD at the University of Minnesota, also in soil science, and I live in northern Minnesota, in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, with my wife, and I have two children of, uh, that are adults in age, and we like living here in northern Minnesota. Perfect. Trent? Yeah, I'm a native of uh, northern Minnesota and the UP of Michigan. Always been interested in science, was an outdoors person, really enjoyed fishing and hunting and decided I needed, that was my calling to do environmental things. And so my degrees are in biology and environmental engineering from Michigan Tech. And I have worked uh, in the environmental field since then for both the state of Minnesota and now with the Forest Service. I have married and have two boys, one in college and one a senior in high school. So both of you work for the Forest Service. For people who aren't really sure what that is, can you tell me a little bit about what the Forest Service does, what kind of work they do, anything like that? Sure, I'll let Trent speak about the National Forest side, but we have three arms in the Forest Service. The big arm is the National Forest. And then we have two smaller arms, state and private forestry, which is kind of like our extension service. And then we have research and development. And I'm part of research and development. Basically, we get paid to publish and write grants and have graduate students and, and whatnot, just like faculty members at universities. Trent over has done the Superior National Forest. Trent? Yeah, so like Randy said, there's the three arms. And I work on the National Forest side or the National Forest Systems, which basically is the face of the Forest Service that you see if you go out and visit the forests, you'll see the ranger stations and such. And so we're really the side that manages the forest. And the concept is that we would have science questions and we would go to the research branch, like Randy's branch, and they would answer those scientific questions for us to help us manage the national forest to get the outcomes that we're looking for. There's about 400 to 500 scientists nationally within the National Forest, U.S. State Forest Service Research and Development Group. Technically, we're the largest forestry research organization on the planet. That's super cool. I had no idea. And then we're going to be talking about a specific element today, mercury. So can you tell me more about what mercury is, where it's found, some of its properties? Sure. Most of the mercury that's in our ecosystems are the result of burning of fossil fuels, mainly coal. And so it comes down to precipitation, both rainfall and snowfall. So even in very remote places, there's still mercury. So it's ubiquitous across the planet, and it gets into our lakes, either through direct precipitation or through runoff from the surrounding watersheds. And that's how it starts to bioaccumulate in our fish. And then it works its way up to people, up the food chain from there. Can you tell me a little bit about what some of the dangers of mercury consumption is, or a little bit about how much is dangerous? Well, the problem with mercury is it can be pretty fatal even at very low concentrations. It's difficult to measure, but even at low concentrations as it bioaccumulates in the food chain, it can be a million times more concentrated in our human bodies than, say, the lake itself. And so what it really affects is some of the neural networks in our body and to some degree our reproductive systems. And those are the two main uh, issues related to uh, mercury effects on human health. Just a side question that popped in my head. Is it as dangerous to fish and other animals as it is to people? It certainly has been shown to have issues related to other things that eat fish, like eagles, for example, and otters and loons. 
they can have health issues as well. I don't know if it's been shown really to have an exact, uh, a really impact on the fish itself, but again, it's the things that eat the fish. Actually, Abby, I was just going to say that we did a study here a number of years back on loons in the Superior National Forest in northern Minnesota and found that I think it was about 10% of the loons were having some effects from eating mercury and fish because obviously they can't limit their consumption like humans can. I'm curious, how do you guys, in both of those cases, was that something where you were reaching out to the research branch as well for that? Yeah, well, you know, it's, we had a question come up, you know, when people come up to the forest and want to recreate and fish, you know, it's the same as anywhere else in Minnesota, they look at fish consumption advisories that the state puts out and it tells for each lake how much fish they can eat depending on if they're a woman of childbearing age or not, or a child, because they're more sensitive. And so a lot of it then goes to why. Why is the fish so high in mercury? What's the problem? And can fires affect that potentially too? So that's some of the research questions that we had and we found people to help answer those questions over the years, both within Forest Service research and other researchers outside of Forest Service research. Yeah, I'm fascinated by kind of this partnership because I know you were actively involved within the research process, even though you weren't necessarily part of that branch. We can talk about that a little bit more later, but you brought up fires, which is kind of the other main focal point of today's episode. So how do you think that fires affect these normal pathways that mercury takes in its just general cycle to get into fish or people or the environment? So fire is an interesting mode of disturbance in that it pretty much volatilizes everything that's in its path if it's severe enough. And so it's not just mercury, it's other things. But in this case, we were concerned about mercury being volatilized and going up in the ash and being redeposited locally following the fire. Mercury sort of has this global cycle where, like I said, it's ubiquitous across the planet, but it also has local deposition trends. And those trends can be a function of following fire ash deposition and things like that, soot deposition, et cetera. And we showed in other studies that you can have about a 40% increase in local deposition following a fire. The question was then, can we pick that up in the food chain of these lakes? And there's a few different terms you guys use in talking about fires and categorizing them. So can you tell me about what those terms are? Trent, do you want to talk about burn severity? Sure, yeah, no, that sounds good. And I was going to put a little uh, piece of history in, in the discussion, too, that this all came up because in the Boundary Waters and the Superior National Forest in 1999, there was a major blowdown event where we had lots of trees blown down with a severe storm. And the way that was chosen to treat that issue, because now there's a large wildfire risk, was to do some prescribed burns within the Boundary Waters to take fuel away from any fire that might start there uh, and prevent it from getting outside the boundary waters. But as we proposed that path, there were questions that came up regarding what will that do to the mercury content of fish. And so that's kind of the management side of things and how this all started. But um, getting back to burn severity, you you can imagine as you look at a forest and a fire would start, there's a lot of places it might go. For example, if it's a low severity fire, it would just creep along the ground and burn the leaves and things like that, and that would be it. But there are others that are more severe where they climb up into the trees, and like the most severe fire would be called the crown fire, where you have the entire tree on fire, and it's the fires coursing through the forest from tree to tree to tree. So you can imagine in all that that the fire severity is related to a number of things, including the drought conditions of the area and potentially how the trees are arranged as far as how close they are to each other and how many trees are between the top of the canopy and the ground. We call that ladder fuel if there's trees in between there that can carry the fuel up to the crowns. So that's kind of a a way to look at fire severity. And is it done, you know, tornadoes have a certain scale or hurricanes, are fires categorized the same way or by percentage of the area burned? How does that work? Hmm, I don't know that I've seen an official scale, but definitely the concepts that you're talking about as far as 
you know, the amount of acreage burned, how severe those acres are burned, like how much vegetation is left, how much soil is left. Those are the factors that would go into that, but I'm not aware of an official scale. No, I don't think there's an official scale, but a number of researchers have come up with different indices of relating the severity of the fire. And like Trent said, it's usually related to the, the impacts on the vegetation and or the impacts on the soil surface. So then moving on, you had mentioned a little bit about how you were structuring your experiment already, but can you tell me more about the goals of what you were specifically testing for in this, the landscape that you were operating in? It's, you know, a really beautiful area. Can you tell me more about some of those things? Sure. Well, the Boundary Waters New Wilderness Area is, um, like it says in the title, it's a wilderness area, so it's non-motorized traffic. They have over 200,000 people visit annually every year. I think it's the most visited wilderness area in the United States. Is that correct, Trent? It's either the United States or the Eastern United States. I'm not sure, but um, either way, it's very popular, as you can tell. There's over 1,000 lakes and 2,200 campsites. You know, it's an ecosystem that we all treasure, for sure, up in northern Minnesota. So that's really the reason we wanted to look at this, and especially from an angling point of view. If the fires were going to have some sort of impact on mercury and fish, National Forest would like to know that so they can alter, potentially alter their fish consumption advisories or alter where they're having folks camp and things like that. And so that's what really got us started on this. And so back in 2004, 2005, we got a grant from a place called the Joint Fire Sciences Program, which is an interagency group of folks that give out grants, all dedicated towards looking at fire impacts and smoke and things related to fire. And within that grant, we started picking out pairs of lakes in the Boundary Waters, ones that we planned to have prescribed fires on and ones that we planned to not have fire on. And then we started sampling soils and water and and fish. And in this particular watershed in the papers here, we have two lakes, Thelma Lake and Everett Lake. Thelma had had fire in it for about 150 years, or at least in our recent history. And Everett had a small prescribed fire in the watershed, and then several years later, it had a a wildfire on the Ham Lake fire, which burned about 99% of the watershed. As you were collecting this data, you were also doing some sampling of three different factors in this environment, the soils, the lake water, and the fish. So can you describe how you go about testing each of those for mercury? Yeah, so we sampled soils at a number of plots in each watershed. I think there were somewhere between eight and ten plots in each watershed, and we sampled soils both before fire and after fire in both of the watersheds. And generally just sampled the very upper part of the soil because that's the part that would be most affected by the fire. And then in the lakes, we sampled both near the surface and near the bottom out of canoes. And then in the spring, we used shockers to shock the fish to try to collect young of the year perch or one-year-old perch. For the water, I mean, does mercury sink? Is it pretty even throughout? What was the justification for doing both of those levels? Well, um, lakes in our part of the country do something what's called stratifying during the summer. So the sun will warm the upper layers of the water and the bottom layers will stay cool. And what will happen is the lake will sort of separate into two parts. They'll have an upper layer and a bottom layer, and they can act differently, can have different concentrations of chemicals. So what we wanted to do is sample in both layers so we had a characterization of the entire lake. How did you go about getting those two different depths without, you know, because obviously water moves and mixes in with itself. So how did you avoid contamination from other layers of the stratification when you were taking samples? So there's a water sampler called a Van Dorn sampler, and you can picture it as a, as a plastic tube with two rubber ends on it. And what you can do is these two rubber ends can be uh, released at different depths by what's called a messenger, which is a weight. So what you have is you have this plastic tube on a string, and you lower it down to the depth that has depth marks on the string. And when you get to the depth you want, uh, you attach this messenger to the wire, and the messenger slides down the wire, and then it hits a release, and then the two rubber ends close. 
So the sample's basically taken at that depth, wherever you have it at that point, and then you pull it up. And since it's closed, it'll just have the water from that depth. How big is the tube? Um, I don't know, about uh, 16 inches long, I think, and diameter of about five inches. That's super cool. It's like a water trap. Exactly. Did you get any surprises in any of your tubes? Like, did you catch anything <laughs> by accident in them ever? <laughs> I don't know that anybody ever caught any fish in them. You know, we were also taking plankton samples when we were out there. So the little uh, animals that live in the water and, you know, they would be caught in there, of course. But when we were trying to catch those, we caught those with a net. So I don't know. I'll have to go look through the books. Maybe there's some <laughs> discussion I'm not aware of. Yeah, I'm just imagining like a little turtle in there or something. <laughs> um, were you catching the plankton for the same project or a different one? When we were collecting samples, the theory was is that, you know, a lot of the cost is involved with getting people to the site, especially with sites like we're talking about in the Boundary Waters. So when we get somebody out there, we want them to take as much information as they can, because a lot of times you're not entirely sure what other additional information may be useful until you're looking at the data. So we had them collect all kinds of common water quality related data, including plankton. And so at the time we didn't even know how we would get it analyzed because you need somebody to look at the animals under a microscope and identify them. And none of us had the skill and we didn't have the money to do it. But later, luckily, these samples preserved fairly well and we were able to find somebody a number of years later to do the analysis on all of our old samples. So that's an additional piece of the information we have now to go with all the water chemistry and other information. And that not only helps with this study on mercury cycling, but it could answer a lot of other water quality related questions that we may have and currently have with the lakes in northern Minnesota. Neat. And then for the fish shocker, we talked about that on the phone. That's like a backpack, right? Can you tell me more about what it looks like and how it works? Sure, I can uh, take a shot at that. Yeah, it does look like a backpack. It's got a battery on it, and it has two wands. And so um, you put the two wands in the water, and then a current runs between them, and any fish that are in there are shocked, and they float to the surface, and then you can net them and bring them in. And so when we're talking young of the year or year one perch, like Randy was saying, they're like small minnows, basically, is what we're catching and then doing a chemical analysis and confirming their age. Uh, that's basically kind of how that went. And the backpack shocker doesn't kill the fish. Let's say we had some other fish that we shocked besides the perch we were looking for. It just shocks them for a little bit and then they come back to life. But we were obviously really gearing towards getting in those one-year-old perch. Why specifically the one-year perch? We wanted a fish that was in most of the lakes, if not all the lakes we were sampling, and perch is a pretty common species. And we wanted them young, or one year old, so that they had the effects of the fire that previous year. And so the effects would be greatest on the youngest fish in the lake. Because the older fish would have potentially mercury from previous fires, right? Previous fires or runoff events or all kinds of different reasons, yes. Sure. And how do you test for mercury in the fish once you've caught them and confirmed that they're the correct year and, and all of that kind of stuff? How do you do that? In our case, they are ground up in a blender and we just tested the tissue for mercury in a lab down in the Twin Cities and at the University of Minnesota, a colleague of ours, Dr. Ed Mater. That's that's a bummer for the fish. <laughs> um. If you remember the, uh, the Bassomatic Saturday Night Live thing, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, all right. So what I what I really appreciate about this work in particular, one of the most fascinating aspects of this for me, was just some of the really unique challenges that your team had to face. You know, you mentioned already that, you know, there's not vehicle access here. So can you describe what that process is like? <laughs> Go for it, Trent. You did most of the sampling. Uh, I supervised the sampling, <laughs> so I really have to give credit to the crew that we had. We had two college students we would hire every summer for the however many years. I lose track of how many years the study we were able to keep going on it. But, you know, I enjoyed 
having those kids come on and see them go on with their careers after this. But yeah, we were kind of entering into uncharted territory. A lot of water sampling is done, assuming you can back your, your boat to the lake, you know, back it in and have all your stuff in, but we had to carry everything. And so it really got into some discussions early on about how much water do we really need to take out of the lake for analysis because water's heavy. And so we wanted to minimize the amount of water we needed to take. And so we had to have a lot of discussions with the lab managers about how much they need and then making sure that's what was necessary. And then of course, you need all the sampling equipment. We have an electronic thing called the sun that measures concentrations that we lower in the water. So we have to haul that, we have to haul spare batteries, and then we need to haul radios for safety so that if they need help or they need something they can call out. And then you just need your normal camping stuff too, because when you're out, you need to camp through your tent and your sleeping bag and your food. And so there's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff to carry. But, you know, by the first couple of weeks, they got in uh, into shape <laughs> if they weren't in <laughs> shape before. And uh, then they were ready for the summer and, uh, and they enjoyed themselves when they were out there too, which is good. Trent, how far in was our furthest lake, approximately? Oh, <laughs> I don't remember off the top of my head. I think uh, it's probably two, three portages in was our longest, but I don't remember the length of the portages or the distances. But um, yeah, you had to be physically capable really to do this. And, you know, we had a, like I say, a real mixture of folks over the years and everybody did a real good job. And, and like I say, when they were out there, they enjoyed it. You know, if they were into photography, they take pictures. Uh, we encouraged them to write observations in our notebook and they went beyond that and had really interesting narratives of how bad the mosquitoes were that day hmm. or whatever which I, I may take at some point and go back and look at that maybe we need to publish that i'll have to contact all those all those authors <laughs> <laughs> yeah state burn right yeah so one of the other things that i thought was really fascinating is kind of another challenge that you guys have just by the nature of your work is just the variability of the environment. So, you know, prescribed fires, obviously, I mean, you guys are setting those. But with wildfires, there's kind of this weird, like, I want there to be a wildfire, but I also don't necessarily want there to be a wildfire. Or, you know, the wind blew the wrong way. Or, you know, there's just all these different factors. Can you describe what that is like to work with some of those strange, uncontrollable factors, and also maybe some of the things that you guys try to implement to help as much as you can with those? Yeah, so one of the reasons why there's not a lot of information on wildfire effects, not just on mercury, but on lots of different things, is because of all those uncontrollable things that you just mentioned, Abby. You know, we were lucky in that we were able to design a study wherein we were able to do some prescribed fire, and that was the initial plan, but, you know, as we kept up with the study and we kept sampling, we started getting several wildfires over the years, including the one that affected Everett Lake in this study. And so, yeah, the wind can blow the wrong way and the, you know, the fire can go different directions and it's uncontrollable, but you know, it was fortuitous circumstances that we were able to get that wildfire to consume 99% of the Everett Lake watershed. But we have designs around that so that if another fire occurs, you know, maybe we can get some more information. We put collectors across the, the entire forest, for example, you know, in different places to collect precipitation so that we could sort of design for a way to, if something did happen like a wildfire, we were able to capture and get some good information on it. That's great. I love that. In exchange for some of these challenges, though, you guys really do have an amazing workplace when you're uh, – doing this kind of research can you tell me just some of the nice perks or if you either of you have like a fun story about your time when you actually got there <laughs> randy you should go first yeah we do live in a great place and we go to the boundary waters frequently for fun and, and for work and we've had a, a fairly recent fire in 2011 that was the biggest fire that was east of the mississippi uh, for like the last hundred years or so, it was called the Pagami Creek Fire. And we did a bunch of work on that fire as well. And um, that fire had a little bit higher severity than the fire that hit Everett Watershed in this study. And so we got some new information that has come out since on 
to the severity that it has on the soil conditions and, and other things as a result of that wildfire. It's so invigorating to be out there and collecting samples. One of the things that Trent mentioned is we had this blowdown back in 1999 and you know that sort of creates a lot of fuels that can light fairly easily especially with lightning strikes and whatnot and we went and sampled some of these places I was up on top of like map sticks of trees probably 10 15 20 feet in the air at times and so it was real interesting to try to get back and find plots that you put on a map for example and then seeing the reality of how to try to get the back to some of those plots is very difficult at times. Mm-hmm. And I guess I can throw in a story or two. I mean, for me, the thing that is just incredible is, you know, you're paddling through these lakes. You, know, you have to pinch yourself almost. Hey, I'm getting paid today to be out here. But I, I will say that it's, you know, when somebody hears that you're sampling in the Boundary Waters, they picture a picturesque day with sun shining and no bugs. And, you know, in reality, field work's field work, and it doesn't matter when, what the weather is, is you're out there. So you're out there in the rain and, and all the other things too. But there's no place like it. And, you know, at night to me is the best time because the amount of stars that you see up there is just amazing. It takes your breath away. So, um, those are like a couple stories that I had. And, um, you know, it's not untypical to see the northern lights as well at night, which are really cool. Oh, beautiful. How wonderful. <laughs> um, and then one more, like, just quick fun question before we move on. When you guys are spending recreational time in these areas, are you ever, like, tempted to be doing science? <laughs> or as you just <laughs> flip that switch off? <laughs> I'm always thinking about science, even when I'm up there having fun. So yeah, I'm always thinking about it and thinking about if I catch too many walleyes, if I'm going to have too much mercury in my system and, you know, where to catch them and how to catch them and what depths and where, and it's all factored into your thinking when you're up there. Yeah, I've been on a scout trip up there and I'm kind of the buzzkill because one of the kids caught a huge northern and then they were going to bring it back to eat it. And I was like, no, that's not the right fish to eat. We need to eat the smaller fish. So, uh, yeah. And my uh, my colleague here who helped in this study, fisheries biologist by the name of Jason Butcher, I know a number of personal trips where he's come and taken samples while he was on his personal time. Sure. That must be very rewarding work to just be able to go on vacation to land that you are actively working to save and make more enjoyable for other people. That's really cool. Hello, everyone. Hope you're enjoying the show. Interested in learning more? Today's featured article, Yellow Perch, Percoflavicens, Mercury Unaffected by Wildland Fires in Northern Minnesota, published in the Journal of Environmental Quality, will be freely available on our digital library for the next two weeks. You can find a link to it in our show notes. Let's get back to the show. So moving on then to the results, can you tell me what you found from doing all this research? So when we started comparing these two lakes, our hypothesis was that the the watershed that was burned with the lake in it would probably have higher concentrations of mercury and fish. We found that the soil concentrations were lower in the watershed that was burned because it wildflies the atmosphere. I mentioned before that we see about 40% more local deposition following the fire, and we really thought that we could possibly pick that up in the food chain and the fish, but we didn't. And so that was a bit of a surprise, but that's the result. And that's really good news. And at least from a low to moderately severely burned watershed with a lake in it, uh, we were not able to pick up that mercury signal in the fish after the burn. Other things like climate, water temperature, water levels in the lake were more a determining factor on how much mercury is in the fish than the fire. Do you have any theories as to why the fire didn't have as much of an impact as you thought it would? Um, theory being that we just probably didn't add enough mercury to the lake system that we were able to detect it in the fish. Um, we really didn't even see higher concentrations in the water columns either. 
when we compared the burned lake and the unburned lake. And so because we didn't see greater concentrations in the water column, it's maybe not surprising that we didn't see greater concentrations in the fish as well. The question still is out there that uh, if we had a really severe fire, wildfire or prescribed fire, but more likely a wildfire, would we be able to pick up that signal in the fish? And that question still kind of remains to be answered. Yeah, it's a real interesting conundrum, and we've talked about it since the project started, is, you know, you have this pool of mercury in the soil, and then a fire comes through, and then what happens is the question, and some of it goes up in the air, and if out of that pool, the majority goes up in the air, and some of it will fall locally, but a lot of it will just leave and go into the global cycle, so you may, you know, may not have an effect on the lake if a lot of it ends up going through that pathway, but if it either falls locally from the atmosphere or maybe just a little bit is left, but it's a significant amount to the, to the local watershed there that when it gets washed, subsequently washed into a lake, it has an effect. So there's different mechanisms that could push it either direction, and that's what makes it interesting. One of the things that's somewhat unique about the boundary waters is it has very shallow soils, bedrock near the surface. And so when precipitation comes down, there's very little interaction with the soils. Most of it gets washed right into the lake. And so in this case, if we didn't see an effect on the Boundary Waters lakes, just because that rainfall runoff thing is so connected to the lakes, we probably won't see it any other place, just because, like I said, the soils are so shallow that they barely interact with precipitation. You already mentioned some of the future research needs. Can you tell me kind of what other things you guys are looking into with these topics or even personal future research if you guys are moving on to other areas? Yeah, we still have, you know, all the data from other lakes as well over to history. And so if we do have another significant event, wildfire, blowdown event or whatnot, we can go back in there and do some resampling and compare our historical data set to something more recent following whatever disturbance that might be. Um, and we've done that in some cases already and published a few papers, but um, there's always great new questions we can ask based on whatever the next disturbance is. And so our plan is to follow along with what goes on up there as far as disturbance. And if we see another disturbance that affects one of our areas of research, one of our lakes or one of our watersheds, we'll probably go back and sample and look at the effects of those disturbances. Yeah, and I think from my end of things, you know, I'm generally interested in lake health and lake chemistry. And uh, one of the things is mercury, obviously, as we've been talking about. But another thing that I've been really interested in lately has been a trend that's been seen all around the northern hemisphere, which for lakes like ours that are uh, associated with wetlands, we see what's called a browning. They're calling it a browning of the lakes. The lakes are turning browner and browner because of the organic matter from the associated wetlands in their watersheds washing into the lake and that has just a ton of implications and a whole bunch of different things because a lot of different chemicals are associated with that and also things like lake productivity could be associated with that which would mean a lake could get more algae blooms than it used to in the past so I think that's a really interesting area of research that's ongoing that I'll be really interested in tracking. Interesting. Being from Wisconsin I'm used to like you know, Wisconsin Dells duck tours where they're like, <laughs> it's totally fine that the river is brown because tannic acid from the trees. So it's interesting to hear someone describing that specific attribute as being potentially really harmful. <laughs> well, and those waters have always been brown. It's just to the degree that they're, the brownness is increasing over time. That's more of the issue. Yeah, I've never heard of that before, so I'll have to keep my ears open for that in future. I have three questions left for you guys. First question is if people are interested in learning more about this topic, where can they go for more information? So there's a lot of information out there on mercury, um, not necessarily mercury and fire, which is what we study, but there's a lot of information on mercury and mercury pollution. EPA has a number of websites on mercury. Minnesota Department of Health, for example, has a mercury website page. But the mercury fire connection question is you know, sort of novel and that was why we're working on it. And so any publications related to mercury and fire can be found on my webpage as well at www.nrs.fs.fed.us backslash people backslash Kolka, K-O-L-K-A. Perfect. We'll include a link to that in our show notes as well. 
Second question, if people want to get involved in this issue or help out with this kind of thing, what can they do to get involved? Well, I'm not sure if this exactly is going to answer your question, but, um, you know, Randy had said before that coal is the primary source of mercury in the environment. And I think, you know, many people will come up to recreational areas like northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, uh, places like that. And then when they go back home to the larger cities, they'll kind of forget about these places that they love to recreate in. And, you know, they can be good stewards even when they're not physically there because a lot of these pollutants are transported long distances by air. And so to the degree that people, when they get back home, can do things like use energy wisely, reduce their energy consumption, because you can't necessarily change where your power is coming from, but you can change how much power that you use. Those are things that you can do to improve the situation. Yeah, for sure. And then final question is, what is one fun fact about each of you? Well, one fun fact about me when I was an undergraduate student at the University of Texas, I took ninth in the nation at soil judging. There's actually competitions for undergrad institutions to judge soil, and uh, I was ninth in the nation at something once. Congratulations. <laughs> Trent, what about you? Yeah, um, I think the thing that is pretty funny is that being a Viking fan that I am, that's not too surprising being I'm from Minnesota, but I've been surrounded by Packer fans my whole life, especially with some of the people in my extended family and my father and others. And then when I get a good working partner like Randy, it turns out that he's a Packer fan too. So I just can never get rid of these Packer fans. <laughs> As a uh, Chicago Bears fan in Packer country, I can sympathize with you. I totally get it. Um <laughs> Well, this has been so fun. I'm glad that you guys can overcome your sports differences to work <laughs> on such a wonderful project. It has been a blast to talk to you guys and learn all about this. I learned so much in this conversation. So thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Abby. Thank you for having us. Thank you for listening to Field Lab Earth. You'll find a link to today's paper and other resources for this episode in our show notes or on our website. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for show topics, please contact us at podcast at sciencesocieties.org or on Twitter at Field Lab Earth. If you'd like to hear more content like this, please subscribe and don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes or anywhere else you find your podcast if you like our show. This podcast is a joint production of the Tri-Societies, the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, and Soil Science Society of America. Special thanks to Lobo Loco for the use of their song Spook Castle on the intro and outro of our show. Opinions and conclusions expressed by authors are their own and are not considered as those of the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, Soil Science Society of America, its staff, its members, or its advertisers.